Welcome to PCR Talk Evolve 2022. This year is not going to be an on-site meeting, but we're going to have a series of six webinars, four on, uh, three on TAVI, one on mitral intervention, one on tricuspid intervention, and one on stroke prevention. This webinar is the first one in the series of six, and today we're going to discuss, discuss about the importance of hemodynamic performance on of transcatheter heart valves. My name is Lars Sandergaard. I'm my pleasure here to be joined by Shinichi Sirai, Dr. Saito. We also have uh, uh, Anthony Kamulia from Australia. We have Noriaki Yomiyama and Tomoki Usiai. So um, the learning objectives we're going to discuss today is to understand how patient prestige mismatch impact mortality and valve durability and also to learn how parvalva leak may impact uh, the patient outcome, and finally to discuss how design of these fibrostatic aortic valve will influence the hemodynamic outcomes. We want this session here to be as interactive as possible, so I will encourage you to use the chat function. We'll try to answer all the questions or comments you, you send via the chat here. And also, this 60 Minutes webinar is going to be a case-based webinar. We're going to present the case. We're going to discuss uh, the issues about uh, aortic valve replacement in this specific case here. And then we're going to see a recorded case. And afterwards, we're going to end up talking about lifetime management of patients with aortic stenosis. So I think we're going to start with the case presentations. I'm going to ask you, uh, Dr. Uh, Tomoki Osari to, to tell us about the case we're going to discuss today. Okay, so the patient is 79 years old female and her BSA is 1.38 square meter. Her cardiac risk factors are diabetes and hypertension and hyperlipidemia. And she underwent uh, surgery for breast cancer in 2006 and she underwent CABG in 2014. And this time she presented with shortness of breath long exertion, and also uh, peripheral edema was noted. And her, her GFR was 47 and the BNP was elevated uh, over 500. And her ECD shows normal sinus rhythm with narrow QRS. And for medical treatment, we started her on uh, diuretics and beta blocker. And she also received antiplatelet therapy. And her echocardiogram uh, shows normal left ventricular function and her LVEF was 56%. And it also showed severe aortic stenosis with valve area of 0.68 square centimeter. And peak mean gradient was 71 and 46 millimeter mercury, respectively. And her stroke volume index was 27.9 milliliter per square meter. And she also had a uh, moderate mitral and tricuspid regurgitation. And her coronary angiogram showed a LIMA2 LED was patent and the vein graft to diagonal and OM branch was already occluded. And she also had 75% stenosis uh, in left main trunk. So this is CT measurement. Uh, her annulus diameter was uh, 20.9 millimeter on average, and the perimeter was 65.6 millimeter. And her mean LVOT diameter was 21.2 millimeter. And SOV was 23 by 25 by 25 millimeter. And her mean STZ diameter was 22.3 millimeter. And uh, uh, there's a lack of tochasty to in aorta. And her iliofemoral arteries are large enough to accommodate TAVI delivery system. And her STS score was 10.1%. And she was managing well in terms of frailty. Okay, thank you very much to introduce this case, uh, Tomoki. So uh, let's start the discussion for this particular case. First of all, who are the patients at risk of early valve failure? Because uh, even if after placing a THB valve, uh, some valve uh, shows uh, early degenerations. So, I think uh, young age or uh, renal disease are the big impact on the early degeneration. And also the small valve size, small annuli, is very important 
for the uh, valve degeneration. So, uh, Shinichi, what is the uh, definition of uh, small valve size? Uh, Dr. Shigeru, thank you very much for kind. Uh, uh, small annuals also they affect the uh, uh, usually PPM, the patient prophesis mismatch. So, index effective orifice area uh, was of uh, less uh, more than 0.85. Uh, it is uh, not present on my PPM, but the 0.65 to 0.85 moderate PPM and uh, equal to less than uh, 0.65 uh, severe, uh, it was defined severe PPM. So, uh, Dr. Shigeru said, the, so uh, what is the uh, one of the uh, bioprophetic aortic valve degeneration was affected by the e PPM. So, uh, the, uh, one of the risk factors, the PPM uh, was the hazard ratio is 1.95. So, I think the uh, very, very uh, high risk uh, of the e valve degenerations. And the, even the moderate PPM also affects the e uh, uh, valve degeneration and the uh, cardiac mortalities and so on. Then the severe PPM also the uh, affected cardiac mortality. So PPM is also affected the valve degeneration and the uh, mortalities, I think. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Shinichi. Now, yeah. uh, I think uh, the how to prevent the uh, uh, small valve size is very important. So the uh, Noriaki, uh, what is the design, specific design of, of the surgical biopsy <clears throat> to prevent the early degeneration and improve the durability of the valve? Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Sigel. And uh, I think in terms of surgical aortic valve, uh, durability data uh, over 10 years has been already reported However, our small annually uh, requiring a small uh, surgical aortic, aortic valve uh, result in, I think, a significant uh, PPM leading uh, to worse hemodynamic outcome in early phase, uh, uh, even with uh, externally mounted uh, leaflet surgical aortic valve. So uh, I think, uh, therefore, uh, aortic root enlargement may be a, a potential or, and good way to mitigating the risk of PPM after such aortic valve replacement. However, uh, if you uh, consider uh, the case presented in this session, patient has very small annulus and also patient has very small bar server and ST junction. So I think it's very difficult uh, to uh, loot enlargement uh, uh, in the annuals because uh, ST junction and superannual anatomy is also very small. Therefore, our uh, aortic root enlargement is fully performed in the worldwide, I think. Okay, thank you very much, Noriaki. So, Russ, uh, I have a question. Uh, what kind of design? Uh, very important to PPM of transcaster bioprosthesis uh, in small, especially in small aortic annulus. Thank you, Dr. Saito. I think that's uh, an excellent question. And we have seen that despite the guidelines uh, are telling us that mechanical valves should be used in patients younger than 65 years of age and biprosthetic uh, procedures for patients older than that. It's not what we see in real life. We see that biostatic valve is used in almost all patients, uh, even quite young patients. Uh, and that's probably due to that the patient do not want to go on anticoagulation and also have an expectation that we can do a, a put a TAVI valve in when the surgical valve is, is failing, we can do a, a valve and valve procedure. So, so putting this biostatic valve into younger and younger patients, we have to think about two things. We have to think about how should we make sure that the first valve got a long durability? But we also need to have a plan for what are we going to do when this valve eventually is going to fail. And as Noraki just showed you here, if the patient is going for surgery, uh, the surgeons tend to put two small valves into these patients with smaller aortic annulus, 
even though it can potentially be prevented by doing a root enlargement, it's it's not commonly used. I mean, uh, it's associated with a little bit higher surgical risk, but we also see that in real world li- uh, data that it's used in less than 1% of the patients. So quite a few of the patients c- is coming out after surgery with a too small, small valve and and thereby also prone to have earlier valve failure. And as um, Shinichi was showing, it's, it's also going to be associated with an up to a six-fold increase in, in cardiac mortality down the line. So when we have this patient in front of us, the patient who are at risk, and, and, uh, and, and the fa- fact that we can try to prevent is that the patient will have severe patient prestige mismatch. We have to think really careful about what is the best treatment option. And, and as I said before, going for surgery with smaller organelli is almost certain that the patient will have PPM. Your other option is, of course, to, to, to consider what can TAVI do different. And if you get the slide back, I can just show you some of the data because it's certainly not the same rate of PPM we get for all these valves. So uh, the two main type of valves on the market is the balloon expandable valve with an internal lifted position such as the Sapien 3 valve. And then we have self-expanding technology. And the self-expanding technology can be either with a super lifted position as in the Evolute platform or with an inside lethal position, such as in a portico valve, or nowadays it's the next generation, the Navitor valve. And we have all been told that using self-expanding technology with a super lethal position is going to give you your best hemodynamic performance and thereby the lowest risk of patient prestige mismatch and early valve failure. But you can look at these data. These are data from the randomized IDE study, the portico IDE study in the US. So patient is actually randomized between these three platforms. And if you talk about patient with smaller aortic annulus, which in this study is defined that the diameter of the aortic annulus is 23 millimeter or less, you can see if the patient is going for a sapient platform, a balloon expandable valve, one fourth of the patient is coming out of the OR with severe PPM and the, most of the remaining patients will have moderate PPM. So it's only about 30% of the patients who have insignificant PPM. As expected, it's going to be better if you use an evolute platform self-expanding technology with a super lethal position, only 3% will have PPM, severe PPM. But maybe as an eye-opener or surprising for most of us, it's exactly the same rate as you get with a portico valve, or nowadays an avatar valve, despite its a self-expanding technology with an intra and a lethal position. And then you can ask yourself, why is that? And I think it's partly coming down to the valve design. So the protocol, now the Navitor valve, uh, the stem frame, the inflow part of the stem frame is cylindric, meaning that the leaflet can open fully up, so you have maximum outflow. Whereas for the Evolute platform, despite it's a super lethal position, you see the stem frame is tapered meaning that the leaflet cannot open fully up. It's they're going to be restricted by the stem frame. So you have less opening area. And for the Sapien platform, that's the way it's actually designed. It's based on Edvard's surgical valves. So you see there's a tapered leaflet configuration, which also reduced the opening area. So I think uh, you can see there's different valve designs and, and self-expanding technology is certainly going to give you a lower risk of severe PPM than balloon expandable valves, and there's going to be no difference whether you use a self-expanding technology with internal lethal position, such as a portico or navitor valve, or you use a self-expanding technology with a super lethal position, such yeah, as the Evolute platform. Not, uh, so I think not, everyone needs to keep that in mind as we move forward. It's a very clear explanation. Okay, so the next topic is uh, how we can mitigate the probable leakage. So, uh, Tomoki, uh, could you explain the importance of mitigating the risk of probable leakage? Okay, so, previous studies have shown that moderate or severe probable leakage uh, was associated with a higher mortality. And this data from the partner trial also shows that even mild probable leakage was associated with higher one-year mortality and least hospitalization rate. So in terms of functional status, uh, it also showed patients with moderate or severe probable leakage showed less improvement in NYHA class at six months follow up uh, compared with those with normal trace or mild uh, probable leakage. So 
I think it's very important for physicians uh, to uh, minimize uh, the uh, probable leakage uh, in terms of device selection. And we need a careful assessment of pre-procedural imaging as well. Okay, thank you, uh, Tomoki. Uh, Anthony, uh, could you tell me the uh, impact of paravalvular leakage on patient outcomes? Yes, this is um, a really important consideration, and including in the case that um, we're discussing and working out the best strategy for. You know, on one hand, um, we need a system that provides um, a large effective orifice area relative to the patient body size. That is, we need to make sure the patient does not get patient prosthesis mismatch. And we know that balloon expandable systems in someone with a small annulus like the patient we're looking at um, has a very high chance of having significant patient prosthesis mismatch with uh, an Edwards platform or a balloon expandable platform. Mm -hmm. So then we have to look at a self-expanding platform to make sure that we get good hemodynamics. Now, the Navator system out of the contemporary mm -hmm. valves available um, has really impressive paravalvular leak mitigation, um, which is important. And the reason it's important is that paravalvular leak does lead to repeat hospitalization mm -hmm. and the patient we've got in front of us will have diastolic dysfunction, uh, coronary disease, diabetes, and will not cope well with aortic insufficiency. And um, uh, so we need a platform that will uh, mitigate or prevent significant paravalvular mm -hmm. leak. So then we're left with the two platforms, Evolute and Avatar. Um, well, as Professor Sondergaard has shown us, the hemodynamics uh, are basically interchangeable. They're the same with Evolute and Navator. Um, so then paravalvular leak. Well, if we look to the Navator data, uh, that was presented um, about a year ago now at 30 days, um, there were you know, 120 high-risk patients, including patients with small annuli and calcified roots. Uh, there were no patients with moderate paravalvular leak, no patients with severe paravalvular leak. 80% of patients uh, in that cohort of 120 patients had trivial or no paravalvular leak, and um, the remainder had mild. So I think what we need to do is look at access to a technology that can give us can give us self-expanding hemodynamics, but also with paravalvular leak protection. So I, I guess I would be erring on a Navator valve for the case that you're proposing there for those reasons. So if I can just follow up on that. Uh, I mean, uh, we have all aimed that you should avoid to have moderate paravalvular leak. What about mild parallel leak? Is that going to be an issue also as we move to patients with longer life expectancy, or is that sufficient if you can just avoid to have more than mild? Okay. Oh, I uh, think that Lara, that's a great point. I think you know we need to, as we move into low risk, uh, intermediate risk, low risk, we need to be aiming to give the patients a surgical outcome in relation to paravalvular leak, at the same time as giving a better than surgical outcome in terms of effective orifice area. And um, there, there is some data that perhaps even mild or mild plus paravalvular leak uh, is potentially still, um, still associated with poorer outcomes. In the fin valve registry, uh, there, there seemed to be somewhat a dose-dependent effect with some signal that perhaps even mild paravalvular leak is problematic. So trying to look at a system that almost obliterates paravalvular leak in most patients is probably important and more important when we look at lower risk, I think. Okay, Anthony, uh, thank you. So, um, Noriaki, uh, in which patients the paravalvular leak has a big uh, impact on outcomes? Okay, our next slide, please. Firstly, uh, I introduced the predictive, predictive PBL uh, recently reported. As you know, the uh, device running zone classification and the sizing THV implantation depths and uh, nose dilatation uh, are, are significant uh, 
uh, impact uh, predictor of PVL after TAVI. And uh, also, uh, who uh, is at risk of PV, uh, PBL, and also uh, who is at risk of uh, heart failure due to PBL. I think a uh, uh, significant risk of rehospitalization re of PBL uh, may be the patient who has a small chamber uh, and or significant uh, left ventricular hypertrophy I think uh, this uh, particular patient has a uh, 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 highly risk of a uh, population of a smaller annual patient. That's why a smaller annual patient has a uh, challenging anatomy uh, in the chubby field, I think. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Noriaki. Okay, we want to, you know, heart team discussion, you know. So for this particular patient, what is the best treatment? Lance, Lance, could you uh, make a yeah, start of discussion? Yeah, I summarize the patient. It's a patient who is 79, so she will probably have a reasonable life expectancy. It's not going to be 20 years, but I think we, we need to aim for a valve with a, with a good durability more than uh, a few years so so again we should do everything we can do to avoid severe ppm despite she got a small aortic annulus she also got uh, pre-existing coronary artery disease so i will also try to favor a valve which uh, will make it feasible to access the coronary arteries afterwards uh, we know that intra and leaflet position is better than super leaflet position with regard to to access the coronary arteries and also large stem cells are better than smaller stem cells to, to bring a catheter in. Uh, so that is probably going to be my um, two uh, main um, points on my shopping list, a valve which have a good hemodynamics with low risk of PPM and thereby good durability and also will allow to future access to the coronary arteries. Okay, thank you. Uh, Anthony, do you have any uh, additional comments? Yeah, this is, um, you know, a, a very typical real-world patient. And um, I think, um, in particular, the um, elderly females with the smaller annuli um, with a reasonable life expectancy. So we want, we want to um, use a prosthesis that gives good hemodynamics. Uh, I think in my practice and 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 the data is bearing this out and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the data that was at tct this week uh, a balloon expandable valve in this patient would not be a good thing um the the, the the gradient would be over 10 possibly over 20. the effective orifice area would be left at around one or maybe a bit less so they clearly a self-expanding platform is what is required for this patient that is the best treatment and uh, we then need to think about coronary access, paravalvular leak mitigation, and and I would tend to favour the Navator system in in this in this setting uh, for those reasons. Okay, so Anthony, thank you. We know there was some some new data presented at CCT last week and uh, about uh, PPM and, and patient outcomes. So maybe you can just shortly update us on on this news. Hmm. Yeah, it, this was interesting data. This was from the France TAVI registry. Um, and um, a cohort of 1,000, well, nearly 1,200 patients, a cohort of nearly 1,200 patients, uh, predominantly intermediate to high risk. Um, and this was a sub-cohort of patients with an annulus similar in size to the case that we're discussing. So an annulus diameter of less than, uh, of 23 millimetres or less. And using propensity matching, using the cohort analysis to look for differences, comparisons and contrasts between patients with a small annulus being treated with a balloon expandable system or a self-expanding system. And the findings at the 12-month mark were uh, interesting but not unexpected. Patients who received a balloon expandable system had significantly higher gradients with an average mean gradient um, uh, over 10 and an indexed uh, orifice area of, of less than 0.9 centimetres 
uh, square per metre squared. Um, and what was startling to some extent is that 8.5% of the patients in the balloon expandable group had severe patient prosthesis mismatch, not moderate, severe. Nearly one in 10 patients treated with the Edwards platform uh, in this small annuli group had severe patient prosthesis mismatch using the same definitions as we've discussed tonight. And um, patients treated with the balloon expandable system had a near threefold risk of having patient prosthesis mismatch of moderate or severe um, uh, severity compared to patients treated with self-expanding systems. Now, the real kicker from this data was that we've known this for a long time. We've known for a long time that you that patients get superior effective orifice areas with lower gradients with self-expanding platforms, in particular the patients with small, smaller annuli when compared head-to-head -head, uh, with uh, the balloon expandable Edward system. We've known that for some time. What we haven't been sure about is does that affect patient outcome? We know from surgical cohorts that patient prosthesis mismatch uh, portends early valve failure and mortality. What the real pepper in this data was that at the 12 month mark, severe patient prosthesis mismatch in a TAVA cohort um, was an independent predictor of mortality by 36 months. Um, and this is a piece of data that we hadn't really uh, been shown in the TAVI setting previously. We were a bit unsure as to whether or not TAVI-related patient prosthesis mismatch was objectively a bad thing. And I guess to summarise from the data out of the France registry, and not surprisingly, to be honest, it makes sense, giving a patient prosthesis mismatch with a balloon expandable system is associated with increased mortality at three years. Okay, Anthony, thank you very much for your good explanation and the uh, situation of PPM. Okay, so uh, Noriaki, could you uh, present the today's plan for procedure of this patient? Mm -hmm. Okay, slide please. So uh, I just briefly summarize uh, the patient is a uh, uh, 79 years old female and with a small body. Obviously, patient has a very uh, high surgical risk. So are uh, we uh, selected a uh, transfemoral tabby? Next slide, please. So our procedure plan is uh, firstly, uh, we choose ultrasound guide light uh, transfemoral access with a one stitch a pro style, and then uh, we close the 14 French C's. Then uh, we use 18 millimeter balloon for pre dilatation, and according to the patient anatomy, we selected a Navita 20 centimeter valve uh, with the LB uh, pace lead. So, next slide, please. I'm going to introduce our Navita valve design features. So our Navitu Tava system is a newly approved or self-expanding Tabi valve in Japan in 2022. And uh, this system offers intelligent design, including a smart PBL ceiling and navicel calf, mitigating the PBL. Moreover, I think your interannual leaflet design provides a hemodynamically stable and accurate placement even without uh, pacing uh, during deployment. I think uh, also uh, with cylindrical shaped metallic flame, uh, exceptional single digit uh, gradient will be achieved uh, after valve deployment. As you see, a uh, large cell design also offers to uh, minimize uh, the risk of uh, coronary obstruction and uh, provide a favorable coronary reaccess after taver in the future. Next slide, please. And this is a FlexNavi uh, delivery system. FlexNavi delivery system is a very low profile, which allows uh, 5.0 to 5.5 millimeter minimum vessel diameter closing and a highly flexible uh, catheter. 
enable excellent deliverability even with uh, belly tortuous anatomy with hydrophilic coating. Moreover, Flex Navi system provide accurate and stable valve deployment at annual position with uh, recapturable and uh, repositionable features. So uh, let's uh, see the uh, recorded uh, live demonstration. And uh, also the femoral artery puncture. We are using uh, echo guidance. Then place the uh, prograde. This is the Amprat Supersif wire. This is a 14 French introducer. So we can find uh, 50, almost 70, 70 meter mercury difference, peak historic difference of pressure. Hi. Uh, 
I'm taking a 18 millimeter uh, bulb for pre dilatation. E. です。はい。はい。はい。はい、ペーシングオフ。オッケー。アイムリムービングシースアウト。ちょっと血圧を低いね。少し上げてほしいですね。いい。Very smooth. Okay. Uh, I want to check the bulb uh, pigtail position. Okay, it's okay. This is a cast over a projection. Okay, the cross she must ne. Okay, the patient uh, has a bloody cow there, so I want to keep this patient on uh, pacing. So, I will go. Pressure is stable. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to the. Mother, mother, I'm not done. More, 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 more. I think uh, the position is perfect. Then I want to remove the pigtail catheter because uh, the everything is very stable. Okay. So yeah. Okay. I'm going to deploy this valve. Mm -hmm. Do we uh, remove the wire a bit? Ah, yes. Okay. Please. Yes. This is very important to remove the wire. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Very slowly, very slowly, I'm removing. Very slowly. Okay. I think mm. it's released. I think so too. Mm. Mm. 
はい Could you hold the wire please? Yes, it's done ちょっと合わせてセンターはい OK the patient sinus rhythm came back We cannot find any pressure gradient at the peak level. Nothing. Can you see? I don't see. <laughs> It's perfect, no. I think. It's okay, perfect. Okay. Okay. Uh, no leak. Yeah, echo for that. Okay. Very, very stable, very calm procedure for Navita implantation. Can I take it out? Hi. Yes. The pressure is 18 and 50. 18 and 50. Stable, stable. Stable, right. Very good. I believe in the volume as well. Okay. Okay. This is a single problem procedure, and we can safely finish the procedure. No bleeding. Very quick. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, this was a case of Navita uh, 23 millimeter valve implantation in small lady, Japanese lady patient with uh, a high risk of the surgical uh, valve implantation. So, could you discuss about uh, this case? Shinichi, do you have any comment or any uh, point to discuss? So thank you very much. Great uh, live demonstration, uh, video live demonstration. So uh, through the case, uh, all the head dynamic is stable, and the yes. finally, and the finally, uh, the hemodynamics and uh, uh, simultaneous uh, pressure measurement, no or oh, almost no or oh, oh, pressure. Uh, differences and the uh, diastolic, uh, di uh, di diastolic pressure is also the uh, high. So maybe it, it means, uh, I think, the uh, no parabolic leakage. And, and, and uh, from the angle, from angle, so it shows also the uh, no parabolic leakage, very, very stable and the great hemodynamic result, I think. So, Shinichi, uh, you have many yeah. patients with small annular in Japan. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, in which patient do, uh, are you taking the uh, balloon expandable valve for small annular patient? For small annular patient. So, maybe, so yeah. as, uh, uh, later we discuss about the, the uh, valve degeneration. So, tubing yes. champ procedures with coronary uh, access is needed. So, we usually uh, use the balloon expandable valve in spite of the small annual patient. But the, uh, from the uh, advent of the inhibitors, so gradually we uh, change to uh, the inhibitor uh, for such a patient because uh, early valve degeneration also uh, uh, is uh, uh, because of the uh, PP, uh, severe PPM and or uh, severe uh, parabolic leakage, uh, Dr. Anthony said. But the, uh, 
uh, so P, uh, PPM also uh, is the greatest uh, PPM, uh, sorry, part of the generation uh, code. So uh, we usually use the uh, high, higher uh, EOA uh, valves. We think. Okay. I think. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Uh, Russ, do you have any uh, comment or discussion on this case? Uh, first of all, I, I would say congratulations. This was a very nice demonstration of how to use the Navitra valve. I think you, you demonstrated all the features here. Uh, and just to highlight some of them, I mean, we would be talking about self-expanding technology for these patients. And, and I think if you have this Navitra valve on the market, we also have the Bivalent platform and, and two great platforms, but also two very different platforms. I mean, Everyone who have started out with the Evolute platform and, and start with the Navitor maybe believe it's the same one, but you see they actually behave different. First of all, you see this system here is really flexible if you have tortuous anatomy or acute angulation of the orchard guards, horizontal also. This is a valve where you can have a very flexible system and you get it coaxial aligned no matter how horizontal your orchard is. It's also one of the reasons it's very flexible is that this capsule is not that stiff. Uh, so it, it's more flexible. On the other hand, the opening force is not as high for the Evolute valve, so, so you need to do more pre-dilatation, as you did in this case. I won't say you need to pre-dilate in all cases, but maybe somewhere between half of the patient or two-thirds mm. of the patient uh, should have a pre-dilatation to help the valve to have better expansion. The, the radial force is the same between the Navitor valve and um, the Evolute platform. Another thing which is very different here, you can see between the two platforms, uh, are, is that um, you have this internal leaflet position. So you do not need to pace during valve deployment. Uh, often you have no compromise on, uh, on the cardiac output. So you can take your time, you can go slow all the way up during the deployment, which we all know that it's going to make the valve sit in a more stable position. If you go too fast on the wheel, it tends to dive to the LV, so that's not uh, the same issue here as for the Evolute platform. And finally, again, it's a cylindric inflow portion of the stent frame and not a tapered for the Evolute valve. So it, it doesn't tend to dive as much to, towards the LV. So, so there are, of course, some similarities between the two different self-expanding platforms, but there's also certainly some difference uh, during the deployment, which I think was demonstrated really nicely here in this case. Okay, Ralph. Uh... The gravity of uh, transcatheter heart valve is a very important topic. And also, the, uh, we don't know uh, exactly what we can do for the failed transcatheter heart valve. So do you have any uh, comment, Lars, on this? Yeah, again, um, we, we can we can bring the slide up, and uh, that, that's uh, again. You, you've seen also the American guideline, which came out uh, was it last year, is now talking about target down to patient as young as 65 years of age. Uh, there's nothing about risk or in uh, the algorithm bet choosing between uh, transcatheter and surgical aortic valve replacement. It's, it's all about what is the patient's expected life, uh, the life expectancy and also what is the durability of these valve. And still we have limited uh, knowledge of, about durability, but there's no, uh, there's no doubt if you're going to move down to patient at 65 years of age with pretty long durability, these valves will eventually fail, uh, no matter what the durability is. And there will be, of course, two options. One is to send the patients for surgery, to explant the valve and put a surgical biprosthetic valve in, which I personally think is very unlikely because when this time is coming, the patient will be 10 or 15 years older. So why should he or she sign up for surgery when uh, time was done early on, when the patient was younger and had less comorbidity? And you can also see this is data from Gilbert Tang, work in progress. So if you look at the data we have from, uh, from this international registry, that surgical expansion of these uh, failed transcatheter heart valve is associated with a quite high mortality. 30.6% at 30 days. And this is even if you exclude patients who had explantation due to active endocarditis. So it's certainly not a, a simple procedure. And often it will involve root replacement because you'll have ingrowth of uh, the tissue into the stent frame if the valve is sitting there for a long time. The other option uh, is, of course, to put a second 
transcaffeine hybrid into the first one, which is failed. You see here, it's also at a quite high risk. The third day's mortality is 3.4%, which is very high number nowadays where, where everyone is running a type program where I think most sites will have a 30 days mortality around 1%. So it's, it certainly has some issues as well. And, um, and, and, Maybe you can address uh, the, some of the issues we're doing at Tavi and Tavi, Anthony, uh, in this, because uh, there are some things we need to have taken into concern. Yeah, this is um, this is going to be a growing area, I think, as we move toward patients who are living out their vows. And, um, yeah, the American data was pretty sobering of where we're heading. I mean, the lifetime journey approach, I think, is a good conceptualization to communicate with each other and in heart teams about how we how we think about these patients. Um, you know, in the last couple of weeks, uh, a publication came out in the United States, half of people getting an aortic valve replacement under the age of 65. So someone under the age of 65 in the US getting an aortic valve replacement, half of them are now getting TAVI for various reasons. So this is, and this is happening all over the world. So then we need to think about coronary access. Coronary access is important. Um, and we need to integrate that with favorable hemodynamics and uh, large effective office areas to reduce stenotic early degeneration. Uh, this is a beautiful illustration that uh, Lars uh, the, uh, Professor Sondergaard has put together, and I, I, I look at this a lot and use this a lot when um, I'm talking to colleagues and teaching. Um, so, in in the first panel is a low low frame balloon expandable valve. Um, however, the downside to a balloon expandable valve and a small annulus is um, a high effective orifice area and patient prosthesis mismatch, and we know that's probably associated with increased mortality. The second frame. Um, the second frame is an intraannular leaflet self-expanding design with uh, a frame that extends above the coronaries but with large cells that make coronary access favourable even when a second intraannular device is implanted. And in this situation, hemodynamics and effective orifice area uh, change only a fraction and you can still expect a gradient less than 10. Whereas a balloon expandable system with another balloon expandable system inside it uh, in a small annulus, you're going to be looking at a gradient in the 20s. It's not reasonable. The final image on the right is uh, consideration of really the Evolute platform uh, where there's a high frame um, and uh, we should also integrate that a high frame with small cell size. Um, and there's issues with coronary reaccess with the first valve, let alone if another TAVR is inserted into that initial uh, Evolute system. And then taking into account the tapered design uh, potentially has issues for hemodynamics as well. So it might be that an intraannular self-expanding system that preserves coronary access, like Navitor, it may be that mm -hmm. uh, this provides a path in the present time at least that balances effective orifice area and coronary reaccess um, that allows us to navigate between uh, the downsides uh, presented by the other uh, major systems. Okay. And okay, maybe, okay. maybe Anthony, I can just, uh, because just chop that up, because I think, there's also been some new concept how we should do TAVI in TAVI. So I think most of us has in the past uh, had the concept that we're going to use the same platform. But but nowadays it's been suggested to use a shorter stent frame inside the first one. Uh, it could be a balloon expandable valve inside a failed uh, self-expanding valve. And you can see there's different approach to do it. You can implant it relative high and you can implant it relative low into the first failed valve. And by implanting it low, you're going to have a shorter new skirt. Uh, the leaflet is going to be pushed aside. So the shorter the new skirt is, the more easy it's going to be to access the coronary arteries. It, of course, comes with a price because part of the 
leaflet from the first ballot is going to have this leaflet overhang. But at least on the bench, it's been sh showed that um, that it does not affect the hemodynamic performance of these valves. So, so this may be the future when these patients are coming back with a self failed self-expanding technology to put a balloon expander valve, in, valve inside it and put it as low as possible to have a short new skirt with some leaflet overhang, <coughs> which will still provide access to the coronary arteries without compromising the hemodynamics. Okay, now. Uh, thank you for your uh, kind explanation of the situation. Okay, could, could you close uh, this uh, uh, meeting, yeah. please? Certainly. Before I do that, I would just yeah. ask you, uh, Noriaki, is, are there any questions from the chat we should address? Or, or have we covered most of it during the discussion the last hour? Yes, uh, Lars, uh, we have just uh, one question uh, from our friend, Kentaro Hayashida. So Kentaro has a, a very uh, interesting question. So uh, Kentaro asked me to, uh, sometimes uh, we can see the uh, upward motion uh, after, just after valve deployment to the uh, sending out. Uh, what is the tip, tips and tricks to avoid yeah. upward motion just after deployment? Yeah. Do you have I any what, ideas? Yeah. What Kentaro should talk about is talking about the, the navage of valve. So again, remember the yeah. inflow portion of the stent frame is cylindric, which have a lot of uh, favor of this party wise have so good hemodynamic. So um, it also means that when you release it, the fine release, it can move both up and down depending on what tension you have. You know, the Evolute platform tends to go towards the LV because it's tapered. So what you do before you release it is, as you demonstrated in this recorded case, make sure that the delivery system is in a neutral position. Pull the wire back. There should be no push in the wire, which could push the valve towards the altar. And also make sure that the delivery system is in a neutral position. So if you, during the deployment, have pulled a little bit or pushed a little bit on the delivery system, take that tension out. So it should be on fluoroscopy sitting in the middle of the eight sitting altar, and then you can re release it. And that's often going to make it sit stable. If you still have some tension, you may pull it up as, as you release it. So, so keep that in mind. This valve can move both up and down, but just keep the tension uh, in a neutral by pulling the wire back and also have the delivery system in a neutral position. And again, this was a little bit back to what I said before. Everyone uh, has probably started out with the core valve, the Evolute platform. And when you start with this technology, you just say, this is another self-expanding technology. And I think all of us who have done this, uh, I think you can agree, and Anthony have made this mistake until we understand this is a different platform. It's going to behave different. But as soon as you understand that, it's an excellent platform. So I'm just going to, to summarize this. I think we had a very nice discussion. I learned a lot to myself. I also hope that you who attended this webinar did that. We talked particularly about the importance of hemodynamic performance of these valves and uh, how to ensure that we have a good durability. And we know that the patient at particular risk are patients with a small aortic annuli, as you see in Asia and, and Japan. And remember, there's two parts of this story. Choose a platform which have a good durability, a long durability, and that's a platform which have a low rate of severe PPM, even in small aortic annuli. The second part, which is as important, is if you treat patients with longer life expectancy, you need a platform which, when it eventually is going to fail, you can do a tarp in tarp procedure in and still have access to the coronary arteries. And as we just discussed here at the end, uh, having an inside leaflet position using a, a short stent frame as a second valve, as a balloon expandable valve, will still secure your access to the coronary arteries. So I want to thank all of you for, for being part of this discussion. I want to take, thank you specifically, specific, uh, Dr. Saito, for, for an excellent recorded case demonstrating uh, how the Navitor valve is, is, can be used. And, and again, I thank you who attended this uh, webinar as a participant. <laughs> Remember, this was the first out of a series of six webinars for PCR Talk Health 2022. So please join the remaining five webinars. Thank you all.